What does outdoor exposure have to do with dementia? Well, in general, we'd like to see people outdoors more because indoor, you're going to have more exposure to things like mycotoxins. Unfortunately, you know, we, most of us build our homes out of mold food. And so we end up, especially if you have any sort of uh, water damage, uh, that's a problem. But when you go outdoors, be careful. You want it there with the problem, of course, is air pollution. And of course, here in California, we have the California fires. We've had them now a couple of years. Uh, and these things are going to increase risk for dementia. If you look at the people who were exposed to the World Trade Center cloud as an example of poor air quality, 13% of those people had already by 2016 developed cognitive decline and many of these relatively young people. So this is a huge issue and more and more data now showing that air pollution is associated with cognitive decline. So that's the main thing. We want to be exposed to clean air. We want to be exposed, stay away from both the mycotoxins, the indoors and with the, and the air pollution of the outdoors. It really turns out to be critical for risk. And it's been shown that people who have APOE4, who have increased risk because of their pro-inflammatory state, uh, also have increased risk if they are associated, uh, if they have exposure to air pollution. What more can you tell us about the process of how neurodegeneration actually occurs? What are the molecular events that drive the process of that neurodegeneration? Yeah, so there's a whole set of events. This is, you know, humans are complicated organisms. And at the center, as I mentioned earlier, this amyloid precursor protein that can be, uh, that can produce uh, two synaptoblastic peptides or four synaptoclastic peptides. Now it also signals downstream to lead to phosphorylation of tau. And tau is an interesting molecule that is phosphorylated in association with Alzheimer's disease. And again, been vilified. People say, oh, that's the tau, that's the problem. Well, it's, the, it's responding to the overall signaling again. And some of that tau phosphorylation is coming from APP itself, others from other sources, but it is part of the downsizing. And so tau is a stabilizer which actually stabilizes microtubules. So when you're now growing these things out and you're, you're having your axons connect, you need that stabilization. If you're going to pull that back rapidly when you signal, oh, synaptoclastic activity, then what happens is you phosphorylate the tau, which is what pops it off. You can think of this a little bit like uh, uh, bolts. This pops off the bolts and allows this to collapse. So no surprise, when there's lots of collapse going on, you now look and you say, oh, there's tau phosphorylation. It also is a, it signals in multiple other ways, interestingly, uh, both tau and uh, APOE enter the nucleus and actually affect the gene transcription. So again, you're changing the program. You're going from a production mode to a destruction, to a pullback and protection mode, uh, from a growth mode to a protection mode. And that involves changes in tau, changes in signaling, changes in APP cleavage, and all sorts of downstream signaling related to a number of molecules GSK3 beta is one of the things that actually phosphorylates the tau. And interestingly, that's, that one's inhibited by lithium. Now, again, too much lithium, very bad, uh, very toxic, but many people will take small amounts of lithium uh, as part of an overall optimal program, you know, five or 10 uh, milligrams uh, as an example. And so there are all sorts of signaling mechanisms that are critical. If you look at APP itself, it interacts with a molecule called P75, which is something that binds to nerve growth factor. It's part of the overall nerve growth factor receptor complex, which is track A and P75. This interacts with dozens of other molecules. So again, it comes back to the fact that this is a master regulator. This is like the president of your country saying, things are good. We're gonna forge new alliances. We're gonna build new bridges. We're gonna grow our country versus Versus your president saying, oh my gosh, we're being attacked. We're going to have to now put some napalm on these attackers. That's the amyloid. This is the antimicrobial effect. And we're going to have to now live in a slightly smaller country. We're going to pull back as we are protecting ourselves. 
please explain what your program is to prevent and reverse cognitive decline. Right. So the fundamental difference between between what what everything that you know, we've done and what's been done previously is that, as I said earlier, we're not predetermining a treatment and saying, okay, you got Alzheimer's. We don't know what causes it. We're going to give you a drug. It's not going to work. You're going to die. I mean, that's the old-fashioned approach. We're saying no. We need to understand for each person and preferably as early as possible what's causing the decline. We look at dozens and dozens right now we evaluate 150 different factors and they include historical factors, you know, things like, and they include genetic factors, you know, and things historically, you know, have you had depression? Uh, have you, uh, you know, which suggests you may have some inflammatory uh, characteristics. Do you have uh, mercury in your mouth? Uh, you know, do you have gut symptoms? I and mean, these are all part of the story. So we want to look at the human organism as the complicated, uh, the coordinated functional unit that it is and then we evaluate appropriate lab data. And from that, we construct an overall uh, look. We, can, we have a computer-based algorithm that we have produced, which now subtypes people and says, okay, you have mostly an inflammatory type, or you have mostly a, an atrophic type, or a glycotoxic type, or a toxic type. And then from that, we can derive an optimal program. And of course, it includes optimal nutrition. The idea of ignoring all these things and just giving someone one little drug that does one little thing uh, is, is really a naive approach to the overall problem. You know, you're dealing with a complex system. And so we want to attack this with the appropriate drivers. And yes, um, it, it's, uh, it typically includes some supplementation. It may include specific drugs. And we would argue that drugs are gonna work much better when you are doing the right things. And therefore we believe that in the future, drug trials should be done on the backbone of an optimal approach. This idea of where things are bad and you have essentially a floor effect, you don't see anything with a single drug. Let's get people up into a dynamic range and now we can see small impacts. And by the way, we hear this all the time. Someone says, oh yeah, I can see that adding or subtracting something, I can see it getting a little better or a little worse because they're now in a dynamic range as opposed to being uh, in a place where things are so bad. There are so many problems that nothing, no single thing you do has a real impact. So that's the idea that this is a precision medicine personalized protocol that identifies and addresses the drivers of the cognitive decline. When dealing with Alzheimer's disease, why is it important to identify that root cause? Because if you are not addressing the root cause contributors of which again, 10, 25, you know, there's, there's a number of these, then you're circumventing those. So even though you may get a little improvement, the underlying problem has not been quelled and therefore it is continuing. You're going to have problems in the future. So even at the best, you get a short-term solution, which again, we haven't seen with the drugs, even a short-term solution. You're gonna go right back to degenerating because you haven't gotten rid of what's actually causing the problem, which is why it's so critical to do that. Now, if you get rid of what's causing the problem, at the very least, you're gonna be more stable. Now, if you're now improving things and getting appropriate synaptoblastic activity and appropriate support, you're now actually going to see improvement, which is what we see repeatedly.